Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Cinematters New York Social Justice Film Festival 2021. My name is Isaac Sablaki. I'm director of film programs at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Thank you so much for being with us and joining us throughout this MLK weekend. We look forward to seeing you um, for so much more. Right now, we're up with the conversation for the film Los Hermanos. Um, thank you all for joining us, and I hope you've enjoyed the film as much as we did. Um, we are excited to include you in the Q&A for this film, so please, um, uh, if you have any questions, of course, um, put them in the chat, and then when the time comes for um, the Q&A section, we will, um, we will open your mic. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to all of our partners on this festival who are doing a lot of the work on the ground and are amazing with us. Um, but specifically for this film, I want to give a big thank you to the Composers Diversity Initiative, um, Santos Morales Santoro. Is he here? Maybe not. Um, but uh, a thank you to them and to the Sphinx organization, which you'll hear a little more about in a moment. Um, also, of course, if you are inspired by this work and uh, can support um, all of our work and keeping our work um, virtual, especially in these challenging times, please text the word community to 56512. Again, community to 56512 to be able to support. Um, I also want to give a big thank you, of course, uh, to our whole team here. Um, and um, hope you'll everyone um, will join us for all the um, upcoming films um, that we have uh, going on till tomorrow. So please join us for more. Um, and now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, this afternoon's panel. Um, and I'll start with the um, directors and producers, the co-directors and co-producers co of uh, the film. We have uh, Marsha Jarnell, um, and she's uh, produced a slate of films for um, Patchwork Films. Um, and we have Ken Schneider, who's a, an award-winning um, producer and director with over 40 documentaries under his belt. Um, I'm also really honored um, to introduce someone who you will all um, recognize immediately, um, Ilmar Gavilan. Um, Ilmar, thank you so much for being here. And um, to moderate this conversation, um, I'm excited to hand things over to Lauren McNeary, who is Director of Corporate Partnerships for our partner, the Sphinx Organization. Lauren, I hand things over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and thank you, audience, for joining us this afternoon for this very exciting conversation about uh, the documentary Los Hermanos. I had a chance to watch it a couple of times over the course of the week, and um, it is really just a breathtaking story. So let's start with how uh, you, Martha, and, and Ken came to become familiar with Ilmar and Aldo, and what about them inspired you to create this documentary? Thank you, Lauren. We had been making documentaries in Cuba for about uh, six or seven years and were very taken by the arts culture in Cuba. And there's the arts that we all think we know about, which is um, popular music and dance, and they sometimes show up in films. Um, but the more time we spent there, the more we discovered that the, the art landscape was much richer than that. And when one of our previous films screened at the uh, documentary, at the rather film festival in Havana, I uh, was lucky enough to attend during that same trip, the opening night ceremony of the Havana Jazz Festival, which is a world-class jazz fest. And uh, the opening night uh, performer was Aldo Lopez Gavilan, who at that time was a 35 year old pianist who had been talked about in Cuba as being up and coming, but and had some international renown, but not so much here in the States. And um, I'm a big music fan, I'm a music person, and I'd never heard music like this before, and I was very taken by it. And I came home and I said to Marsha, Marsha, this is um, a remarkable player, maybe, you know, we should make our next film about Aldo. And uh, Marsha and, said. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, what's the story? 
Um, and we, you know, we said when we just, we have to have a story if we're gonna make, I mean, not to make a film about this musician. And then uh, we were lucky enough to meet Omar at a screening of another film of ours in New York. And we had a lovely brunch with him. And, uh, and he said at the end of the meal, you know, all those coming. And we hadn't known that. Um, and uh, it was the first time they were gonna tour together in the US. And uh, we thought, well, something's gonna happen here. This is gonna be a story. Um, and it had all the elements of a, of a uh, kind of archetypal story about two brothers who've kind of lives have gone in different directions and then have the opportunity to be reunited. Um, mm -hmm. So we, six weeks later, we were filming. Awesome. <laughs> and <laughs> I was going to say that was the cadence of the story is um, Ilmar, just your time away uh, from Cuba and your want to make, you know, be on stage with your brother to create and make music with your brother. Um, so how was that experience after so many years away and not being able to uh, perform with him? How was that experience to have a whole tour with them? That experience uh, was really fulfilling. And uh, I had to like, uh, you know, put water in my eyes to, to, to make sure I wasn't dreaming because it seemed so unreal uh, years before. And mm -hmm. I always wanted to, that, to do that, to, to perform with my brother here in the States for him to meet my extended family, the Harlem Quartet. Uh, I thought we would make such a great pair, but it was something so unrealistic that uh, it was in the back of my of my mind as a beautiful utopia of some sort. So when it became a reality, I, I was really like elated. I was so happy all the time. Even the mundane things of, you know, catching a plane, perhaps missing a plane, dealing with rental cars, all of that was elevated to a, cele a celebration. It was so fun. And I really want that to happen again. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, it was really cool to see how um, your brother had composed works and would send them to you. Um, and that you, along with the Harlem Quartet, got to perform some of those works. Um, what, was, what was that like? To what it seemed very personal, the things that he, the works that he had shared with you and sent with you. What was that like sharing those works with your extended family, the Harlem Quartet? That was also super good. It's like sharing a, a, a diary with uh, loved ones uh, because basically every time he sent me tapes when I was in Moscow, that was a, 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 like a synops synopsis. Like in one musical phrase, you can tell an entire chapter of a book of your personal life uh, because music is just way more uh, expressive than words. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the way we used to communicate. He would share his, his uh, feelings. His, I could tell even what pieces he's working on just based on his recording because he always had this amazing ability to uh, use whatever composer he's working on and make it his own in his own compositions. So literally like uh, these tapes were like a, a true letter, uh, like a diary. So later on, the diary became more, more complex, uh, of course, because his life experience grew, uh, especially when he moved to London. Uh, he started composing really, really complex stuff. And part of the complexity is that even though he was writing for piano, his inner ear was more orchestral. So it was very natural to convert some of this composition to, this, to a quintet, to add my extended family, to add the Harlem Quartet to it, because already inherently in the music, there were colors and voicing that were uh, not just for the piano. So he could just expand it to a quartet in the, and actually he has a lot of uh, symphonic compositions today, including a piano concerto that was originally just piano. It's just the way his uh, musical mind works. Wow, and it seems like that is uh, 
inherits or innate within your family. Uh, in the documentary, it mentioned that your mother was a musician, your father was, was a musician. Um, so let's take it back to the beginning. Um, you started your core studies in Cuba and you moved on to Moscow and then Spain and the US, which is how you became familiar with the Sphinx organization. And you're actually a past winner of the Sphinx competition. Um, your brother also mentioned that he got his most, the bulk of his core musical training in Cuba. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about the parallels because one wouldn't think that um, access would be available to that uh, level of education um, in Cuba for free, but in the US it, it, it costs a short, <laughs> a small fortune to invest that type of um, money, to invest in that type of talent. So you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it is uh, quite um, remarkable that we had we led parallel life and not been in the same geographical space for so long. And also, even calling Cuba was very hard before uh, apps start becoming more available. I remember because it was uh, two dollars a minute, so we really had to condense our conversations <laughs> growing up. Wow. And uh, an internet just recently uh, became slightly available in, in Cuba. So it is uh, tremendous that Aldo uh, became such an amazing pianist and amazing uh, composer in, uh, in that environment. I have to say though, Aldo, um, he finished high school in Cuba, uh, studying with my mom and my mom's students. The thing is my mom herself studying in Moscow so uh, the education is not insular at all. It's very broad. Uh, the influences that uh, the pian piano school in Cuba, even before the Cuban revolution, uh, the piano school was quite good. There are few household names in the States now uh, from that era. Um, um, so, you don't really, you didn't really need internet to get to, to get access to to the level abroad. And in the case of my brother, he went to London for his um, for his college. So he mm -hmm. expanded even more. Before that, he was mainly uh, influenced by the Russian school through my mom. And then when he he got to London, he uh, I remember his teacher was a specialist in a. Uh, the classical period. So he he was very interested in the refinement and the constraint of the classical, uh, meaning Mozart, Haydn, that classical period. And uh, there, uh, he also started improvising just to make some pounds in a side. Uh, before it was a private thing, composing, improvising, sending me musical letters. There it became uh, a gig. Once in a while, uh, he, he would go to a bar and improvise and, and later on, uh, the, the first cellist of the Harlem Quartet, Desmond Naismith, originally from London, he remembers Aldo, I could not believe it. He <laughs> said, I remember that crazy guy looking like you with big hair. He was killing it in a jazz bar. I'm like, who is that guy? And when Des told me that, I could not believe it's such a small world. But yeah, Des was hanging out in a bar not knowing five years later he will meet me and we will be part of, of the original members of Harlem Quartet. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a very interesting uh, connection there. It is. Um, so the Harlem Quartet, um, that is an affiliate of the Sphinx organization as well. Uh, can you touch on how the Sphinx organization not only impacted your education and your studies, of the violin, but um, the trajectory of your career. Oh, absolutely. Her, uh, winning Sphinx uh, competition was definitely a pivotal moment in my career. Um, 
it opened up so many opportunities, like even uh, just getting uh, uh, a chunk of money for me back then and being exposed to, uh, I mean, and, and being a feature soloist with numerous orchestras, which later on opened more doors. That's just in the, so just simply me as a solo player. But then that brilliant idea that Aaron Dworkin, the, the founder of Sphinx had of putting the first uh, prize winners from different years and different uh, uh, categories in one quartet. He named the quartet Harlem Quartet because he already had in mind that we will be going to many schools in Harlem and, uh, and we did. Um, and uh, also that's one of the reasons we start being musically bilingual, meaning also do a little bit of jazz because when we were doing this outreach in Harlem, it was so hard to keep the kids' attention with the wonderful standards that we love. Uh, so we incorporated a piece like uh, Take the A Train, uh, mm -hmm. uh, arranged for string quartet. And, uh, and then we noticed the kids were tapping their feet, just uh, you know, kind of uh, following along with the rhythm. And it was so much easier to engage them. And that led to more and more jazz repertoire which eventually uh, led for us to meet Chick Korea, And uh, we did an, an album together, won a Grammy with the album, and then toured all over uh, the world, basically Japan, the States with Chick Korea, which uh, sort of uh, put us in a, in a really interesting position in terms of uh, the marketability of the quartet, being able to play classical music at, at a very high level as well as um, jazz. Wonderful. I feel like uh, the, you have been speaking so much. Let me pull Marsha and Ken back into the conversation. Um, the art, with everything that's going on right now in this film festival is really dedicated to uh, Martin Luther King's birthday and the issues that have been plaguing our country and the world. Late, uh, in recent months and years. Um, and music plays a soundtrack to that. The arts uh, provide an outlet, provide uh, just so much for everyone. Um, and so I wanted to ask, um, was that a factor in why you chose to highlight Aldo and Ilmar? So, um... Originally, we uh, we were interested in, in looking at the arts in Cuba, generally, because um, they're so much a part of that culture, and, uh, and we were kind of fascinated by it. But this particular story um, took us in many directions, uh, and, and oddly enough, it sort of landed at a moment where I think we really need this story, because it reminds us about possibility and what hap can happen when borders can be crossed and just, you know, the opportunity, you know, to experience beauty and family and all of all of those kinds of themes that are in the film. So, um, you know, I, I think we, initially we had this idea of looking at uh, the U.S. through uh, Cuban eyes and, and Cuba through um, U.S. and uh, Cuban, uh, Cuban American eyes and kind of getting a, a being able to see our country in relief. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was definitely part of the, um, but really the, the music is the ambassador to you know, all of these kinds of, you know, to understanding what you know, the relationship is between US and, and Cuba and, and all of those other kinds of issues really are, I mean, the music is in the forefront of this story and all of that is kind of context. Also, I think Lauren, um, for us, the the art there is a confluence between the art and the activism, but um, we generally we try to find stories about people, you know, character stories in which we can embed and understand um, certain issues. So we don't think of ourselves, we don't think this as an overtly political film, even though it's playing out against a political canvas. You know, we there have been many filmmakers who have made films looking at the Cuban system and the American system and doing a compare and contrast. And that was not necessarily our inquiry. 
But this idea of the two brothers who were not able to be together um, was, was for us very poignant and it was also a way to look at, um, you know, to look a little closer at, at not just US policy, but at Cuban culture. And that's something that I think, you know, we both think a good story can do. The, the story is the entryway for us, not, not the politics. But mm -hmm. certainly we hope that the, the social justice themes are, are there and they're present for and, viewers. And, and uh, just to say that part of our work with this film is to connect with people who are doing activist and advocacy work, you know, for public support for the arts, uh, for diversifying classical music, like the work Sphinx does, um, and uh, about making music education possible for all, you know, every kid. So um, we, we want this story to be in the hands of people who are doing that work and we're working hard to do that. Yes, um, just in our partnership itself, it's, I found out so much about your work in this film um, and how closely um, our work and missions are tied together um, and highlighting voices and um, artistry that is not mainstream uh, and projecting that and showing the world what could be possible when you look at the, at the larger landscape. Um, one thing that was super interesting for me was um, that, the, uh, that the social justice piece was sort of the background story. And in seeing how difficult it was for Ilmar and Aldo to connect and to even tour together for uh, the short amount of time that they did, I was really interested in finding out any obstacles that you all had to overcome on your end. Um, were there any or were there any that stand out to you? Well, over the, the 10 years that we have spent traveling, traveling back and forth between San Francisco and Cuba to make this and three other films we've made, we have gone to Cuba pretty much every which way except swimming. You know, we've, <laughs> gone, we've gone through, we've taken a charter flight from New York. Um, I've gone from Miami many times. We've gone through Mexico City and through Cancun. Um, we've flown through Panama City. Um, and, uh, and once from Los Angeles, once from the West Coast. And once there was a direct <laughs> flight from LA to Havana, you know, during wow. the during the sort of 18 months of Obama's, uh, he, Obama did not end the, the embargo, but he loosened the restrictions, which made possible not only our ability to travel and make films, but that's also the window in which Ilmar and Aldo were able to freely move back and forth. And during one of those years, I think I counted, I think Aldo made about 12 appearances, nearly monthly appearances somewhere in the US to perform, including, um, he was commissioned uh, by a symphony in Lake Tahoe, California to write an original piece, a gorgeous piece, um, which we hope will get, you know, wider, wider play sometime soon. And, um, and then during the current administration, it, all of that became harder. It became harder for him to get exit visas. It became more expensive because he had to go to a place that had a U.S. embassy anyway. So for, for that collaboration, for Ilmar and Aldo to be together, um, I think Ilmar can speak more directly to that, but we were pained that that was so hard for them. You know, in terms of us, we were able to navigate. Um, so sometimes we had, you know, customs people at US airports yelling at us, but we were able to do everything fairly legally um, with um, the paperwork we needed to move back and forth. And another thing that's important for us when we work in Cuba or anywhere is we have a local crew. All of our crew in Cuba um, are Cuban. We don't travel with, with an American crew or American equipment. So it, it eases our travel. And it's also important for our filmmaking that we have um, both you know, ambassadors and informants to, to help us figure out um, you know, how to tell our stories and, and, and which, how to navigate if there are any tricky shoals. Um, and also to, to correct us when we mess up because we don't or always we don't, get it right understand. Yeah. if we miss something. Wonderful. Well, uh, we are coming up on our Q&A session. So I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to share what is coming up on the horizon for them. And we'll start with you, Ilmar. 
Well, I'm really excited that uh, I finally have a CD with, with my brother, just the two of us. Um, again, it's a complete dream, uh, made reality in no small part by the film, without spoiling too much of the story. Um, and uh, so the, the, the album is called um, Hermanos Brothers, just like the, just like the, like the movie. And we have a small tour put together, uh, just Aldo and I, as well as Aldo and Harlem Quartet uh, coming up in this new window that uh, we look forward to with uh, Biden. Wonderful. Yeah. Very exciting. Uh, Martha and Ken? So um, with this film, you know, it's, it's on the festival circuit, which is virtual for the moment, and it will have a, a, a theatrical, probably a virtual theatrical in the spring, and then a public television broadcast in the summer, or in, I'm sorry, in, in next fall. So we're working on all of those fronts, but the other work we're doing, which maybe some uh, people in the audience are interested in, is in this moment when everything is virtual, there's possibilities to bring the story and potentially the musicians to your community, to your school, to your community group. Um, and we are beginning to schedule those kinds of screenings um, where there's an opportunity to talk about all of these issues or to just talk about music, um, the nature of the music, the unusual quality of this music. So uh, we're, <laughs> That's what's next for me, for us, and for the film. Wonderful. And for myself, oh, sorry, Ken. Did you have anything to add? I didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, it, just ditto. <laughs> um, the one thing I would say is it's been a, it, I'm really excited about our collaboration with Sphinx. This is uh, the beginning of, we have an event uh, with Sphinx at the end of the month. I, I It's a, an organization I, deeply admire and I'm looking forward to doing whatever our film can do to help enable the work of Sphinx, which I think is part of a, you know, uh, the broader discussion that we're having about, about race and culture and the various ways in which, um, in which things manifest and don't manifest in, in, um, in, you know, in the arts, in our politics. So I'm looking forward to many more of these, Lauren, with you and your, and your organization. Thank you. And, uh, and Ken, uh, go ahead, Marcia. I just was going to uh, hop in and, and mention that we do have a, a few other um, impact partners besides Sphinx, which I, I should have mentioned. Uh, the Compos Composers Diversity Collective is one of them, um, who I think is co-presenting this screening. Um, and uh, the El Sistema USA, which is involved in bringing music education to every kid in this country um, and uh, the Cuban American Youth Orchestra, which uh, does exchanges with young people um, playing music together across borders. So we're working with all of them and we welcome other partners. Wonderful, yes. Uh, we are very familiar at Sphinx with a number of those organizations and have partnered with them as well. Um, as Martha and Ken mentioned, we will be the Sphinx organization itself will be hosting a screening of Los Hermanos during our annual uh, convening, the Sphinx Connect, which is running January 28th through 30th. Uh, we welcome any and everyone to join us. Uh, it will be held virtually and um, you can register at our website, which I believe is in the chat bar. Um, we also have our annual Sphinx competition running uh, concurrently with uh, the Sphinx Connect convening, and that will culminate on Saturday, January 30th with um, our honors and our finals concerts. You can uh, tune in virtually to that as well on our website, our Facebook and YouTube channels, and the event will begin at 7 p.m. Um, thank you all again for allowing us Oh, go ahead, Mar uh, Marcia and Ken. I just had one more thing. This one's a little bit selfish, but I, I, I want to say it is I had always hoped that our film would elevate and spread the music of Ilmar and Aldo to broader audiences, particularly in America, for the reasons you've stated, Lauren, that you know music is uh, is both an ambassador and it's a metaphor and it's 
beautiful and it, it, it tears down rather than erects barriers. So I do hope that, um, that you know, through increased music programming and distribution of their CD and listen to their websites, that more and more people have the opportunity that we did to hear this beautiful music, which is, is not like other music we have access to. And, uh, and along those lines, just wanted to invite people on the website for the film. We have a whole listen page with many, many links um, to fantastic music um, and uh, to the, their, uh, their individual albums, their collective album, um, and the music of, of the Harlem Quartet and of their dad. Um, so I uh, invite people to check that out. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again. Um, and thank you audience for allowing us to have this conversation. I am going to turn it back over to Isaac who will open up a Q and A. Thank you very much. And I know Ilmar, I know you might have to go. So um, uh, however long you could stay with us. Um, but Lauren, don't disappear so fast because uh, I wanted you to share a little bit more um, about uh, what's going on with Sphinx before we take some questions from the audience. Wonderful. Uh, well, yes, as I mentioned, we are having a very jam-packed week coming up, uh, January 28th through 30th. Uh, the Sphinx Connect convening is our annual convening that attracts musicians, fellows, arts administrators, um, and arts educators and universities from around the world. Generally, uh, when outside was open, everyone would come to Detroit, but this year we're going to be virtual. And we're very excited because that just means that more people can come and attend and learn how to um, not only learn, but also share ideas about how to move forward um, diversity, inclusion, and equity within uh, not just classical music, but the art um, in general. Um, and then our Sphinx competition, which is our flagship program, uh, will be happening at the same time. We have 18 esteemed semifinalists and we are looking forward to see who will become finalists and who will be named winners. Uh, the winners of the Sphinx competition, as Ilmar mentioned in our, in our conversation, will have the opportunity to establish their solo career, to make connections with uh, some of the nation's major orchestras. So we're very excited about that. Um, this is work that we have been doing for 25 plus years, and we've been able to expand from just, you know, identifying artists to creating opportunities for our artists. Um, not just on, stage, on stages, but in C-suites, um, but also for them to create and push their own initiatives of diversity in their own communities. So we're very, very excited. Thank you. We have time for two questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna start with Miriam. Miriam, you're on the line. Hi. Um, as someone who was born in Cuba, and my parents were as well, and left in 1962, I know there was a lot of anger over the years, collective anger on my dad's side against his brother who stayed, and on his brother's, on the bro my uncle's side against my dad. And it was definitely a breach in the family for about 40 years. And I'm wondering if any of that, like it was pretty amazing to watch you two brothers be so happy for each other. So I'm wondering if you could elaborate about that. Um, I think uh, Aldo on my generation uh, wasn't this dramatic, but I'm very familiar with the generation of your dad that you're talking about and with the, like the re resentment that just sits forever. Uh, we never had any 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 of that. Uh, in fact, uh, all we wanted to do is, you know, get together again. We we didn't have any um, locally for us. I think um, really it's a generational thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hope uh, they made up. Uh, they did. After forty years, my father brought his brother here, but there was still and edginess, and right. we, we did meet up in, in Israel as well, 
but there was always an edginess of how, you know, my dad took care of my grandparents here in New York and my uncle wasn't part of that. I think, you know, uh, I think right or wrong, <laughs> I don't my, know. My generation always felt that we, we did not uh, make that part of the history. We dealt with it, but your dad's generation is more involved with actually making the history. So it's more like hands on, more personal. Like if you stay there, it means you're helping, uh, you know, that. And But in, my, in our case, I never think Aldo staying there, he somehow is, no. We were born way after all of this. And all we want to do is just, you know, enhance music in, you know, everywhere and just, yeah, it's a different uh, generational context. Let's grab a question from Ellen Fivenson. Ellen, you're on the line. Well, this was just a wonderful, wonderful uh, movie. Um, I've been to Cuba. Uh, I live in Traverse City, Michigan, and I live 20 minutes from Interlochen. I'm a vo big volunteer out at Interlochen, and I'm a big volunteer with the Traverse City Film Festival with Michael Moore. You know, everything is virtual right now, although Interlochen is, um, is together and, and working, although they are in their own little pod. Um, but I would love to work as a liaison somehow in getting this film up here and you people up here in the future when we can do this. Um, I'm also a U of M alum, so I'm very familiar with the Sphinx organization. I remember the clips of Aaron doing his thing when he was uh, a little one at the beginning of it. So there are lots of ties that we can work on, and I think it would be very exciting uh, to help you guys do this sort of a pro project. I'm always into doing these kind of projects, so this would be wonderful. And um, I'm going to shoot a an introductory thing to Trey, who is the person out at Interlock, and, and I'll get a hold of Michael and have him take a view of this, and we'll start talking. But I just. It sounds it's, excellent. It's Thank you very much. And one more nice connection, Ellen, is one of um, uh, Ilmar's mates in the Harlem Quartet, um, Melissa White, is a, a East Lansing native, and she went to Interlochen. Oh, we lost, lost you. <laughs> I, uh, I did notice it was an Interlochen sweatshirt in the film. I did notice that. I didn't know if that, that's the woman, but it was just like, Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that's another tie. I mean, that's really, um, I can see this really becoming a wonderful event with all of our organizations tied into one. And I would not want it to be virtual. I would definitely want to have you available for the kids at Interlock and they would go just wild. In fact, they do have their own um, motion picture curriculum out there now. I didn't know people knew that, but it's it's very active and this would tie again right into that um, program too. So well Aldo Aldo is coming with me to Detroit in the summer. So one of the hardest part is for him to arrive here in the States. So if he's already in Michigan, maybe we should <laughs> talk about it sooner than later because I don't know, it's like a comment. I don't know when is the next <laughs> the next <laughs> trip here. We'll make sure to connect everybody. Um, I want to give a huge thank you, first of all, Imar, um, to you for your being being here and just um, just sharing your story and being a part of this conversation. Of course, to Marsha and Ken for um, telling this beautiful story and um, and you know your fabulous films and um, being a part of this. A big thank you to um, Lauren Neary again um, from the Sphinx organization um, for also moderating but also connecting all this so beautifully. Um, next up is Hungry to Learn is our next Q and A at. At 6 p.m., if I remember correctly. Um, so please join us for that. Of course, tomorrow, another big day for MLK Day, a big day of film. So join us um, for all those films. And please help spread the word. Tell your friends about this wonderful film. It's only here this week. This is your chance to see it. Um, this conversation will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, please support the festival and um, check them all the films out at cinematters.film. 
and we look forward to seeing you at our next conversations. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.